The first pair of shoes that I ever made took me more than two months and didn't fit. But since then I have made around 40 other pairs of shoes and the only consistent thing between all of them is the fact that I keep learning. Every single pair of shoes that I have ever made has come with an entire education process. And I realized that I've never really actually made a video about all of the shoes that I've made and my shoemaking journey. So that is what we are here to do today. And it all starts with that very first pair that didn't fit. I picked up shoemaking while I lived in Williamsburg. I worked at an 18th century living history site called Colonial Williamsburg, where there were a lot of tradespeople who still practiced the trades the way that they did back in the 18th century. And I was fortunate enough, though the shoemakers at Colonial Williamsburg do mainly men's shoes, one of them at the time, Brett Walker, was also giving workshops on how to do women's 18th century shoes. And it worked out perfectly because I'd already spent a lot of time going to workshops, learning how to do 18th century tailoring and gown making and millinery and even making leather breeches, but I really wanted to learn how to make shoes. Especially since it turns out my feet aren't exactly easy to fit in modern shoes, so most of the reproduction shoes that I had really didn't fit me well, and I was walking a lot of miles for the jobs that I had, and that meant that I had some very sore feet. So it seemed like the perfect opportunity to learn a new skill and get a really well-fit pair of shoes out of it but I was only half right. So I started taking these workshops that were meant to be a slow process over quite a few months, going back every month after essentially doing our homework and getting things prepped because there's so much work that goes into a single pair of shoes, especially when you are learning how to do this for the very first time. But as the workshops went along, I realized that I really wanted to do this much more intensively and was able to start taking individual lessons where I was able to speed up my process. Otherwise, that first pair of shoes probably would have taken me closer to a year. The pair, of course, that I ended up with were far too big. The measurements that were taken in the workshops were way too loose on my feet and I ended up with a pair of shoes that basically fell off of my feet very easily. But honestly at this point I just keep them for nostalgia and to remind myself of just how far I've come. Despite the years of hand sewing and experience I had with crafting and different skills, these are not the most elegant pair of shoes, but I now have better tools. I've learned so much more about the detail work and how fine the stitching needs to be, how to do the seams better so they don't start to pull apart. One of the worst points in this entire construction process was trying to cover the heels. So you actually make a separate heel cup and then insert a carved wooden heel into that space but I really wanted to do it out of matching silk, which is a really common thing in the 18th century. However, I was definitely not at a skill level to be able to accomplish that. So after a few failed attempts at trying to do silk covered heels, we ended up with the Wichita covered heels that I now know are so much easier to do and are honestly the better option when you're teaching someone how to make shoes for the first time. Incredibly difficult, a big failure, but in the end I learned so much making these and honestly they wouldn't have held up to a lot of wear and tear so it's probably better that they didn't fit and that I didn't just wear them to pieces within the first few times. Of course the failure when it comes to the fit of that pair of shoes didn't hold me back at all. If anything it made me far more determined that my next pair was going to fit correctly and that I was going to fix all of the problems that I had with the previous pair. For example I decided to go with a wool pair that was a much more practical choice. Wool is much more friendly than silk. So I did a pair out of wool. I made sure to do a Wichita covered heel because I knew I could accomplish that. The overall shape and finesse and the stitching was much better on this pair of shoes. The fit was so much better. I wore these for miles and miles and miles before they finally wore out. Because not surprisingly, the materials that I'm working with make the biggest difference in terms of the success or failure when it comes to these shoes. And when it comes to understanding how the right materials, especially high quality materials, makes the biggest difference, it brings us around to the sponsor for this week's video, Birch. Thanks Birch for sponsoring. Their extended Cyber Week sale is running now and you can get 25% off of your purchase for a limited time. Check out the Birch site for more details. You may not be able to control what the day throws at you, but you can make it better with a good night's sleep. That's why I'm so happy to introduce Birch. They make mattresses and sleep products that are stylish, comfortable, and environmentally conscious. Not only do they offer the simplicity of having a premium mattress delivered to your door, but they understand the importance of materials. Their mattresses are crafted with organic and natural materials that have been sustainably sourced, assembled in a GOTS certified Arizona facility, and they're free from polyurethane foams and fiberglass, so no off-gassing or irritants. The Birch Lux natural mattress even includes eight different layers of organic cashmere, New Zealand wool, fair trade cotton, and 100% natural latex. And by having wool in these mattresses, it makes them both allergen and mildew resistant. I've been sleeping on my Birch Lux mattress for about two years now, and it has made 
such a difference. And I am so excited that I have added one to my guest room now too. I can honestly say that with my birch mattress, I sleep through the night and I wake up without all sorts of muscle aches and joint pain. And now my guest room has a bed as comfortable as my own just in time for holiday visits. And you don't have to worry about trying it out. With your birch mattress, you get a 100 night sleep trial along with a 25 year warranty. That means you'll get more than three months to make sure that you love it. The best part about all of this is that Birch delivers your mattress right to your door for free within the US. They also offer in-home setup and removal to make your buying experience as convenient as possible. I love my Birch mattress and I think you would too. If you're looking for a new bed, check out Birch Living. Their extended Cyber Week sale is running now. It's the perfect time to upgrade your sleep with 25% off of a new mattress, plus two free eco rest pillows. Visit birchliving.com Nicole Rudolph to find out more about this limited time offer. Thanks again to Birch for sponsoring this week's video. The next pair that I made after that was an earlier 18th century style that had what's called a randed construction. So that white strip of leather that goes around just above the sole is called the rand. And it's very similar to welted shoe construction, which we are more familiar with today, in that that allows me to make a much heavier shoe. So unlike the previous two pairs that need to be a very lightweight sole because they are turned shoes, meaning they're made inside out and then turned right side out before the heel is added, this style of construction is done right side out the whole way through. So the rand is stitched onto the upper and the insole and then the sole is stitched onto the rand. I also decided to go back and attempt actually doing a silk covered heel at this point, which went much more easily. So I definitely learned a lot, even though this was only my third pair. I had continued to do lessons with Brett, do lots of samples and working on other shoes. So that way I could gradually work up skills in different areas and getting used to the tools. So that pair came out so much better <laughs> than my first pair. The next ones I went to after that were because I needed to walk so much in the jobs that I was doing, I needed a much more sturdy pair of shoes. So I went with a common pair, as they're called, which is a much sturdier, heavier, plain black leather. So I had to learn slightly new construction skills for how the uppers went together on that. I also learned a new construction skill overall called channeling. So there's actually a slit made in the sole of the shoe where the stitches go from the exterior all the way into the interior. So you'll actually see the stitches visibly inside of the shoe rather than attaching to an external strip, which means that you have to really fight with the fact that you're working from the inside of the shoe the whole time. So it's not easy. Thankfully, I have pretty small hands, so it was a little bit easier for me than it is for some other people, but it does make for a pretty sturdy shoe, and it's something that I was able to keep repairing and replacing parts on, so that way they lasted a very long time. In fact, they survived today with a clump sole still on one of them, meaning I added a whole nother sole as I wore through the first heavyweight sole. I've also replaced the heel caps a few times. So this was the first pair that I truly got to really wear very hard just to see how the process of wear and tear occurs on these shoes. I had already learned a lot about how to walk in 18th century shoes from the wool pair, but that got especially ramped up as I made more lightweight turn shoe examples for myself. So I made a pair in brown velvet that was based off of an original I got to examine when I went up to the Badashi Museum in Toronto. I made a red and white silk satin pair, and I learned very quickly that I wasn't able to walk like I do in modern shoes. Modern heels are very stiff, very structured. They usually have metal or fiberglass shanks running down the middle of them to keep them in a permanent shape. And so we find it very easy to walk heel toe as we go along. That is not the case in 18th century women's shoes. They are very lightweight, almost more like wearing a slipper or a heavyweight sock with a heel attached. It is still supportive. The heel goes underneath the arch of the foot to offer that support there. But you really can't walk with a strong heel to toe gait. It really requires a bit more of a flat foot. It's not toe to heel so much as just a gliding motion. And so I was relearning how to walk in these sorts of shoes when I was doing miles upon miles of walking. Now, I learned even more when I made my first pair of overshoes. These are meant to protect finer shoes from mud and dirt and rain, that sort of thing. So I made them to go over my red silk satin shoes and I made a very hardy pair. A lot of surviving examples have straps that tie on top of the foot to hold them on. Everything else is pretty open, but I wanted to try and challenge myself, which was probably a little bit further than I should have gone on this, but I made it with a fully covered toe and heel area, which did mean that they were very sturdy and really gripped onto the shoes. However, in walking, you are still going to have a flip-flop motion. These are not flexible and bendable. The structure that is underneath the arch of the foot is actually filled with cork. So these are not going to bend and flex 
well your regular shoes do, which means that you flip flop around, which is thankfully minimized by walking in that gliding motion I talked about. And essentially I learned that you have to sort of step into the overshoes every single step, especially when you're going upstairs. The very first time I ever wore these overshoes, I had a very small walk to the building, but then I had to go up a set of stairs and every single step I went up, I lost the overshoe because I didn't realize that you had to shove your foot in so hard every single time in order to keep it from just popping off. So I learned that very quickly in order to manage to function in these shoes, which also taught me a lot about the fact that these overshoes are definitely not meant for everyday wear around the cities where you're going to be walking long distances. These are meant to carry a lady from her carriage to the building without ruining her nice shoes. And that's really about it. Anything else is just going to wear you out very quickly. <laughs> Now I went on to make myself a few more pairs of 18th century shoes after that. The last pair that I made while I was at Williamsburg was a pair of green leather pumps without the straps across the top, more of an early 1780s style. I also made a pair of embroidered silk shoes that I actually made based off of embroidery drawings that were in ladies magazines in the 18th century where ladies who had plenty of free time were encouraged to embroider their own pair of shoe uppers and then send them off to the shoemakers to actually have them assembled. They wouldn't have made those at home but I did this so that way it could go over to an exhibit over in the UK actually showcasing works with this sort of embroidery on them. That pair of shoes has become my really fancy event shoes and doesn't really go out much. I also made a pair of slippers for working around in the trade shops, just making it easier and more comfortable to work inside of 18th century buildings every day. Those got ruined in a rainstorm though, because I realized I was either going to have to ruin a brand new pair of shoes that I just made or a very worn out pair of slippers. And I was going to have wet feet either way because it was Virginia and there's a rainy season and it just floods up to your ankles, not irregularly. So I now know what water damage looks like on a pair of 18th century shoes. I also started making shoes for other people at this time. Now it's not something I commonly do, but it was something I was gradually branching out into. I made a few pairs of shoes for other people under the watchful eye of my teacher, but the first pair of shoes that I made for someone else entirely on my own was a pair for my friend Gwendolyn, who wanted a pair that was much more colorful and interesting than most of the ones that were on the market at the time. The colors are still perfectly historically accurate. They're just way more fun than a plain pair of black shoes. I also started branching out into other time periods. Though I really adore 18th century shoes and the construction techniques that I had learned up to that point were going to really inform me with other time periods going forward, I felt like I just wanted to keep going further. So the first pair that I ever made outside of this range was a style from around 1810. And this actually has a very small wedge heel underneath. It's a really simple and plain pair, but I learned a little bit about how that construction technique worked in the era where we were transitioning out of high heels into flat shoes. And they were trying lots of different styles and figuring out how that was going to work. So these fit and feel a little bit different than 18th century shoes, just because they don't have the arch support. It's a lot closer to modern ballet flats. I also made a couple pairs of 1820s and 30s styles with completely flat soles and square toes. It's around this time that I carved my first last from scratch and then went and had that reproduced in multiple sizes. So that way I could continue to do flat styles. The 18th century last that I had been using prior to that point came from my teacher. So I was trying to venture out into new styles and therefore needed new lasts, which worked out well because I was also trying to make that style for other people. So I made a couple pairs of early 19th century shoes for my friend, Samantha, who you might know as the Couture Courtesan. And we did both an 1820s pair, as well as an embroidered early 1800s pair to match with her hand embroidered dress. This is one of the pairs that I am the most proud of just because this was the point where my skill in terms of detail work was really taking off. This is around the same time that I also made myself an 1815 pair based off of an original in the Colonial Williamsburg collection. I was able to get in and actually examine a lot of the shoes and I absolutely fell in love with this pair. And I was able to date it precisely based off of the label inside, which put the shop at a specific address that we know that they moved out of as of 1816 and the style of shoes very fashion forward. Actually through doing this, we managed to move back the date of when square toes really started to come in. I had always suspected it was more around 1815, but this provided the evidence that I needed. This, however, was a lot of detail work and getting around all of those curves and binding the edges. It's a very complex process, 
but that was the point where I was really trying to push myself to be able to do those details a lot better. I also continued to make shoes for other people and for museums at this point. One of my favorite pairs that I've made was this very simple 1820s style out of a cotton ticking, which was actually reproduced based off of a receipt in which a plantation owner in Tennessee was actually describing in detail the exact style of shoes that were needed for one of the enslaved women on his plantation. So these were described as being fairly practical, but also double soled because she had a tendency to end up with cold feet and that was causing her a lot of discomfort, which meant that I had to figure out exactly what a double soled shoe construction would look like, how these uppers would be constructed. And when everything I had made prior to that point was based off of an original shoe I had in hand, it was a really interesting and new way for me to look at reproduction. I also gradually worked myself out of the early 19th century and made a pair of 1880s style boots and a pair of 1920s evening shoes. These were not done on the best lasts for what they are, so in making those I definitely learned that I need the right shape in order to get the right style in the end. And they're not the most ideal in terms of construction techniques, but they did really well for what I needed them for. And again, I have learned a lot through that process. With the 1920 shoes in particular, I learned how to actually build up a cardboard shank for the first time, because that's the way that I was finding shoes in the 19 teens and 20s were being made in order to have a stiffer structure than say 18th century heeled shoes. So I learned a lot in construction methods, but I also learned a lot in terms of skiving down my leather, meaning I needed to make a lot of things thinner. Overall, these shoes just built up way too thick and heavy, and that was the biggest education that I got out of that particular pair. The last couple pairs of shoes that I made before I started filming the entire process was a pair of 1790s shoes with the long pointed toe and the really low heel that I both dyed and inked the leather in order to have a little polka dot design. I'd previously seen a lot of ink designs on 1790s shoes in a variety of different collections, and I knew that I really wanted to try that along with the puffball on top. This is also the point where I was starting to experiment with cementic construction. I realized that sometimes I didn't have the time to completely hand stitch a pair of shoes. And so cementing the shoes together allowed me to make these things a lot faster. Now that's not something that's historically correct prior to around the mid 19th century in terms of construction techniques, but sometimes I just needed the right style of shoe and the right shape of shoe without having to spend a solid week or two trying to actually hand stitch every single part of the shoe together. This came in handy though in graduate school when I did my thesis specifically on 19th century women's shoes and part of the thesis was to reproduce a pair of boots from 1864 that survived at the New England Historical Society and we actually not only know who owned them but we actually have the surviving receipt and her diaries so we can actually follow her through her trip over to Europe where she bought these shoes in Paris as well as dozens of letters between her and her other family members. So the fact that there's that much surviving information around one woman is really unusual. I reproduced these as closely as I could to the originals, meaning that I actually had to braid the cord and make the tassels, cover the buttons in the gold threads in order to get the right designs on them, and dyed both the fabric and the cords and everything to match. So this was a very complicated and lengthy process to better understand not only how shoes were constructed in this time period, but also how they felt, how wearing boots of the style actually affected the way that I had to walk. So this was a great comparison between 18th and 19th century techniques and the way that the shoes actually felt on the foot and all of those different types of research. Which leads me into the list of shoes that I have made for this channel. The very first pair that I ever made was actually a 15th century pair. A very long pointed toe medieval style with all the different cutouts on the vamp. This stretched my knowledge of shoemaking a little bit further because I wasn't exactly sure how the construction methods worked going backwards. I could sort of piece some things together going forwards, especially since I was able to see so many antique examples in collections, but when it came to going backwards, there's very few surviving examples. So I had to take what I already knew and adjust it slightly. After that, I launched myself pretty far forward, making a pair of more gothic style shoes. I spent a lot more time researching early 20th century shoemaking techniques to learn a lot more past that 1920 pair that I made earlier, and then bounced back again to the 18 teens, take modern shoemaking techniques of cementing the whole thing together, and 18 teens shapes in order to come up with a shoemaking technique that I felt was a little bit more achievable. The entire point of that was how can I take the shoemaking that I know and turn it into something that is somewhat teachable in a single video because shoemaking is not an easy thing to learn. Even in person with someone helping you, it is a very difficult process. So to distill it down into a single video is really, really difficult. 
So that was my bigger challenge, how to simplify the entire process to a way that would make it more manageable for someone that hadn't done shoemaking before. From there, I started collecting antique shoes and was starting to reproduce ones in my collection. The first one that I did this with was an early 1920s pair of what are called Russian boots. This particular pair I wanted for being able to traipse around New York and I have to say is probably the most comfortable pair of shoes that I have ever made. I also made a pair of 1899 evening shoes with beadwork on the toe for the same trip. The construction of these was fairly simple, but the beadwork definitely added a bit more complication. And these have pretty much become my standard evening shoes for for modern clothing as well. Then it was an 1840s pair of men's shoes for the Gonzo Ensemble, which used some unusual channeling techniques that I had experimented with on some of those earlier shoes, but I had never done a built-up leather heel before, even though this one's relatively small. That required me to learn new skills of how to actually structurally build up a stacked leather heel. I then took a brief moment to return to my 18th century roots to make another pair of 18th century hand-sewn shoes for Sophia, for her trip to Colonial Williamsburg, and then back again to the early 20th century where that leather stacking really became useful in the pair of green Oxfords that I made up. This really took me to the max when it came to construction techniques. I had to learn all sorts of finishing when it comes to broguing and welting and finishing off the edges and the sole and the heel. This pair of shoes honestly is probably the most challenging pair I have done to date with the exception of when I first started out just because so many of the techniques in this pair of shoes were completely new to me and really required a lot of skill and finesse. They're nowhere near perfect, but the fact that this was the first time I had done a lot of these techniques, I'm still immensely proud of them. I also made a pair of 1920s style shoes in a light blue leather that were much more in the range of things that I was familiar with, so those went pretty quickly. And this last year I made a pair of 1890s boots, which I made another new last for, and spent more time learning about how to shape out leather heels, deal with really complex styles on the uppers, and the most recent pair that I have made a video about is making a pair of leaf styled shoes out of actual leaves. So I challenged myself in using a material that is not typically used for shoemaking to see how that went. And they did hold up pretty well through the photo shoot that I actually needed them for. I don't think they're gonna hold up to a lot of heavy wear, but it was a great challenge to work with a new material. Of course, these are all the projects that actually ended up with a finished pair of shoes. There are a couple pairs that never made it to the end. One is an 1850s or 60s pair of side lacing boots that needed to have a built up stacked leather heel. And I did not know what I was doing at the time when I started these. So I got to the point of the heel and things weren't going right and I set them to the side and I have not made it back since I actually learned how to do that properly. So at some point I will go Go back and actually finish the heels and have another pair of boots. I just haven't needed them so I haven't gotten around to that. The only truly abandoned project though is this pair of roughly 1790 riding boots. The pattern for the uppers on these is not something that actually allows a foot to get in and out of the shoe. I did not do the proportions correctly when I scaled it up to work for my foot versus the original pair so I couldn't actually get the last out without taking the shoe apart and I wouldn't be able to get my foot in even if I did finish the shoe. So I need to completely recut the uppers in order to do that. And in reality, right now, they serve better as an example of sort of an exploded shoe construction technique. So you can see all of the parts. If I actually just completely took them apart, remade them and finished them up. So odds are I will just start from scratch if I ever do get around to making that pair. There are definitely a lot of shoes on my list to be made. I have a very lengthy dream board in a way, but most of the time it comes down to what I actually need for different events or different outfits, when I find interesting colors or styles of leather, and trying to plan around that. I also collect antiques, so occasionally something unexpected comes my way, and I feel like I just absolutely need to reproduce it. I definitely want to continue to challenge myself, so that means that I'm going to be making new last shapes. I'm going to be working in new time periods. I want to spend more time on learning how to deal with boots and fitting up the leg and lacing and buttoning. I want to spend more time on different heel heights and construction techniques, figuring out how to do those extremely high heels that you see in different styles and time periods, learning how to do different finishing techniques on leather, learning how to do the Diamante heels on 1920s styles. I have such an incredibly long and ever-growing list of new challenges that I want to take on to try and learn how to do new skills, new styles, new ways. And I never know what's going to end up being the next thing on the list. But that is a walk through the last 12 years that I have spent learning how to do historical shoemaking and finding new challenges every single step along the way.